on Business Incorporated today. Commissioner of Insurance in Ghana reports that 25% of all claims are fraudulent. Traders affected in Tanzania fire ask for government assistance. And Cameroon South to expand by 3.4% in 2021. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Well, let's get it started with intraday market. Starting in Africa, here in Nigeria, the market was unchanged as intraday. South Africa was trading in the negative territory at minus 2.11%. Egypt was also unchanged, while Kenya closed Friday's trading session negative, down 0.07%. In the Middle East, most of the markets were negative as intraday, except for Saudi Arabia, which was up 0.15%. Dubai index was down 0.01%. Abu Dhabi also down 0.05%, while Qatar lost the most 0.75%. We move over to Europe now, where stocks move sharply lower today as markets digested the latest OPEC Plus announcements regarding oil production and continue to brood on inflation and rising COVID-19 cases. Well, Chelsea joins us from Frankfurt to tell us more about that. Hello, Chelsea. Good to have you this Monday. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, so after the flood swept across Western Germany on Friday, the focus this week will turn to rebuilding. How big and expensive will that effort be? It's going to be really an enormous effort. Uh, many parts of Western Germany, but also Belgium, the Netherlands, have been really devastated by the flooding over the past several days. Over the weekend, we saw even more flooding as dams broke, as other rivers uh, basically broke their banks. So we're looking at uh, almost 200 people dead now between Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, as well as just millions and millions of, uh, of dollars worth of damage. People's homes were swept away. People's businesses were destroyed. Vehicles uh, were crushed. Uh, parts of the, the country's infrastructure were really severely damaged, like railways, uh, roads as well. Things like power lines, mobile networks uh, were also heavily damaged by this, these, this flooding. So there's really a lot of, that still is going to need to be done, and it's going to take a long time. What we've heard so far from government officials here in Germany is that they do plan to really uh, get as much support as possible to people as quickly as possible. We heard from yesterday, yesterday from Angela Merkel, for example, the chancellor, uh, that they are planning long and short-term help for people who've been impacted. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the finance minister here in Germany, says that they plan to uh, get about 300 million euros in short-term support support to people who have uh, lost their homes, for example. Uh, and on Wednesday, the, the federal government is expected to pass a larger bill uh, that would help with reconstruction in this area. We don't have a final estimate yet, uh, and we likely won't for a long time, of how widespread and how costly this damage is. But what we've heard from government officials that is it will uh, be in the billions of euros. Wow. Well, unexpected loss there. We certainly uh, wish them the best. And meanwhile, stocks in Europe started the week out in the red as concerns over the coronavirus returned to the forefront. How serious are investors taking these new risks? Well, the, the reaction in, in global markets today has actually been pretty dramatic. Here in Frankfurt, uh, you can see behind me the DAX has taken a really steep fall uh, throughout the day here. It's down almost 3% right now. Uh, other European indices looking uh, quite deeply in the red as well. And in the U.S., uh, stock futures are also pointing down more than 1% for both the Dow and the S&P. So there is a lot of concern on global markets today. And uh, what we're hearing from traders is, is that a lot of this is about the COVID situation. Once 
once again, uh, the stocks that are falling the most here in Europe today are certainly the travel and leisure stocks, which have been doing quite well as uh, economies were able to reopen. But now things like Lufthansa, the German airline, uh, Air France, KLM, down about 4%, EasyJet down even more, almost 6%. So investors are definitely worried about the resurgence that we're seeing in, in COVID infections uh, in, in many countries, uh, largely due to the, to the Delta variant. As well, many people are watching the reopening in the UK, uh, which is also seeing a rising caseloads today. They, they say they will drop all coronavirus uh, restrictions, but many people are looking that as a test case for, for how further reopenings are going to go. So a report by Bundesbank shows that German economy is on the verge of recovering the ground lost during the pandemic with the pickup in growth this quarter. Now, what are the drivers of this optimism? Yes, this is a pretty glowing report from the Bundesbank uh, and sort of against this backdrop we have today of quite negativity in global markets. But uh, from the economic perspective, the German economy has been doing quite well uh, over the past couple of months. Uh, the Bundesbank says that in the third quarter, which we're currently in, is, is going to end in September, we could actually see uh, German economic activity climbing above where it was uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So basically recouping all of these losses over the past year and a half. Uh, the main drivers for, for this are, uh, for one, that we've seen large parts of the economy reopen uh, since the beginning of the summer now that the vaccination rate has uh, really started to skyrocket here in Germany. Basically, uh, all, most business restrictions have now been lifted. Though there also are still things like social distancing restrictions and mask mandates, uh, but businesses are largely reopened. As well, the industrial economy here in Germany has remained very strong throughout the pandemic, but has gotten even stronger now, thanks in large part to exports and even with risks like semiconductor shortages that have been hitting the auto sector, we do still see the German uh, manufacturing sector, things like automakers, doing quite well. So that all is really uh, helping to propel the German economy higher. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chelsea, and enjoy the rest of your day. So we move over to London now where Juliana is standing by on the first day of Freedom Day. And I know Juliana is excited. Uh, if you share that excitement with us. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. And good afternoon, Annie. Yeah. First day, Freedom Day. But unfortunately, FTSE 100 hits two-month low and pound also falls. What's going on in the market on this first day of Freedom Day? Yes, it, you, probably you can tell from looking at me, but there's a heat wave here in the UK um, at the moment. It's set to last for a few days. Lots of things are determined by the weather, but even though the sun is out, the FTSE is very much in the red. Um, at intraday, it started that way at early trading, opened up lower um, than the 7,000 points it kind of targets. Um, and that was uh, because of a myriad of uh, different reasons. One is that OPEC Plus deal that's pushed Brent crude down uh, to the lowest it's been in, I believe about five weeks, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, they're all trading lower by about 3.8 to about 4%. Yes, as you said, it is Freedom Day, though everyone here in the UK is a little bit cautiously optimistic. We are seeing surging COVID cases. I believe yesterday there were over 55,000 positive cases. As I discussed with Chimazay earlier today, we've got uh, three of the most senior men in British politics, all in self-isolation. Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, uh, Rishi Shunak, the Chancellor, and of course, the Health Secretary Sajid Javid, which isn't great, not a really good marketing poster uh, for uh, Freedom Day, especially where the world is looking at Britain um, with their eyes wide open because no other country in the world is taking such a risk um, when uh, cases are so high. But, and there is a huge but, and this does have to be pointed out, nearly 90% of the British adult public have received at least one dose of covid Nearly 70% have received two uh, doses. We are seeing record cases, but we're not seeing those record um, hospital numbers. So as uh, Chelsea was saying in Frankfurt, people are looking at Britain to see whether or not this vaccination programme, uh, you know, reducing and releasing all these restrictions is going to work for the better. Fingers crossed, that's what we all uh, hope. But um, as I was saying, the square mile, not too uh, cheered up. I believe uh, one uh, trader actually called it a contagious uh, market at the moment because 
because all stocks appear to be a lower right now. The FTSE All Share is down 1.98%. The FTSE 100 is down by 2.02%. And the FTSE 250 is down by 1.81%. In the currencies market, the British pound is down on the US dollar by 0.41%, down on the euro two by 0.34%, and up slightly on the Japanese yen by 0.23%. Any. And uh, we're talking about uh, houses again in Britain. Uh, whole bit Britain is up to a new high. Why are we talking about houses? I mean, it's like every week the, the housing market comes into, into the news. Absolutely. I, I believe we've been discussing house prices in almost every day for yes. uh, the past 18 months. But that's because the housing market here in the UK has boomed. It has done exceptionally well uh, during the pandemic. It was one of the first uh, markets to be given the green light by the Prime Minister to open, I believe it was in May uh, last year. And I think a lot of time that people are spending at home, not just really here in the UK, across the world, uh, people decided that they, they over wanted to upscale, downscale, increase the size of their garden, etc, etc. And that's, um, uh, you know, surged up the prices. You can't build houses uh, fast enough at the moment. House builders have been doing exceptionally well um, over the past few months. Not today, though, considering it is seen as it is a contagious market. Right Move, they are um, the, the, the organization that have conducted this survey. They've been looking at house prices between mid-June and mid-July, and then they show that house prices have surged 0.7%. Asking prices year on year are up 6.8%. Uh, uh, so it is doing very, very well. What's it going to be like in the coming weeks, a lot of people are going to be watching very closely because we know that um, the all-important stamp duty tax, which can save or it can cost um, uh, potential home buyers 15 to 20,000 pounds a month, that levy has been lifted. Um, so it will be, uh, we have to wait and see uh, whether or not people are still going to be flocking to buy homes when they know they've got to pay the stamp duty on top of that, Innie. I'll yeah, go for we'll some certainly ice water wait and now. See. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Juliana, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Well, moving on now, shares in Asia-Pacific slipped today as oil prices fell after OPEC and its allies reached a deal. In Hong Kong, the Hang Seng Index dead loss, led Ross losses among the region's major markets, closing 1.84% lower, 27489 0.78. The Nikkei 225 in Japan dropped also 1.25% to close at 27,652.74, while the Topics Index shared 1.3% to end the trading day at 1,907.13. South Korea's Cosby Index closed 1% lower at 3,244.04. Mainland Chinese stocks closed mixed, with Shanghai Composite little changed at 3,539.12, while the Shenzhen component rose 0.13% to 14,992.90. Australian stocks also declined as the SMPX 200 dropped 0.85% to close at 7,286. MCI's Broadex Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan fell. 1.39%. Shares of oil firms in Asia Pacific also declined today, with Santos in Australia falling 2.71%. Japan's index dropped 1.98%, while Japan Petroleum Exploration plunged 2.35%. Going to the Wall Street now, U.S. stock index futures fell during early trade today after the major averages posted by their first negative week in four. Futures contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average slid 246 points. S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq 100 futures both also traded in the negative territory. The Dow and S&P fell 0.52%. And 0.97% last week, respectively. The Nasdaq Composite, meanwhile, was a relative underperformer, dropping 1.87% to post its worst week since May. On the flip side, retail sales numbers released on Friday came in better than expected, rising 0.6% in June compared to expectations of a 0.4% decline. For the month of July, the Nasdaq Composite is down 0.5%. The S&P 500 and Dow are in the green, however, rising 0.7% and 0.5% respectively. The Russell 2000 is down more than 6% amid weakness in small caps.
In the oil market, prices were a little change in early trade today as an impasse in talks among key producers raised output in coming months kept supplies tight, offsetting concerns about coronavirus impact on the global economy. Brent crude for September fell $0.04 cents to $75.51 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude for August was at $74.57 a barrel, up $0.01. Cent. Oil prices slumped last Tuesday after the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries and their allies did not reach an agreement to increase output from August. This was because the United Arab Emirates rejected a proposed eight-month extension to OPEC+. Plus. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we head straight to the African continent. Just stay with us. It's Business Incorporated on Channels Television. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated on Channels Television. We move to Cameroon now, where the country expected the economy to rebound this year, with the growth rate coming close to pre-pandemic levels. The government sees output expanding 3.4% in 2021, compared to 0.7% last year. The Central African economy grew 3.7% in 2019. As part of its 2030 strategy, Cameroon is focused on the structural transformation of its economy towards industrialization, more integration and growth that is more inclusive, sustainable and green. The president, Paul Beer, has called for a 13 percent increase to propose spending in the 2021 budget to 5.5 trillion dollars, 10 billion dollars as his administration seeks to pay down debt and respond to COVID-19 in a bid to cut costs. And Cameroon also sold 685 million euros of 11-year securities last month to refinance more expensive debt. Now, how will all of this affect the individuals in Cameroon? How is it affecting businesses there? We have Mr. Albert joining us from Yaoundé. Now, he's a business entrepreneur there. He's the chief executive officer of Falfe, Falfel consultant in Yaoundé, Mr. Albert Okolu. He shares his experience of how this is affecting him. Hello, Mr. Albert. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining Good us. Good afternoon. Thank so you, too. Yeah, so the government says that output in the economy is expanding compared to last year. As a business person in Yaoundé, have you felt this expansion in your business? Yes. Uh, the government of Cameroon has put some structures in place. Uh, like every other African economy, uh, it is powered by basically agriculture and then the extractive uh, sector and then also the social service sector. So, yes, Cameroon is doing a lot of reforms in the, in the um, economy of the country, making a lot of laws, making sure that those laws are enforced, you know, and then being entrepreneur-oriented, giving entrepreneurs incentives. I'll give you an example. The Cameroon government has done its best to make sure it stabilizes the Cameroon safer. And what does that mean? It means that if you buy something for, let's say, 1,000 safer, for example, and you sell for 1,100 safer, you are sure of going back to the market and buying same product at 1,000 safer. It means, therefore, that you are maintaining your profit uh, level. It's not like other African countries where you can buy something for 1,000 safer, for example, and then you sell for 1,200, and then you go to the market again, and you're buying for like 1,500 or 2,000 safer. So Cameroon has put a lot of uh, reforms in place for people who truly want to do business. And it's affecting the ordinary people and they are taking advantage of it because they are sure that they can go to sleep while their currency is stable. This is very, very important. So go ahead. So there's, this, there's, there's, there's a threat of uh, the Delta variant now, even Nigeria is feeling it of COVID-19. How is that affecting businesses at this time? Well, COVID-19, um, it's the same all over the world, you know. I can say it's the same, it's the elite and then the very poor. The elite, majority of them and some of the poor, they obey the rules of COVID-19, wearing masks, distance, social distancing, washing your hands and all that. But the ordinary people, for example, I take a minor, 
because I operate in the extractive industry. Now, I take a miner, for example, and a miner can go deep to extract gold for maybe 20 feet, 30 feet, 30 feet as the case may be, or pressure stone or diamond or whatsoever. You don't expect him to put on masks, he will suffocate to death. So the ordinary people have resigned, some of them, not all of them, I don't speak for everybody, the majority of the people have resigned yourself to faith. And some still believe that COVID-19 is not an African disease because some give you examples that they haven't seen since they've been shouting COVID-19. No members of their family have died. No friend of theirs have died. And so they believe that there's a lot of conspiracy theories. So it's between the rich and the very poor who resolve, them, who resolve themselves to faith and say, whatever happened, well, let it happen. But first, they're going to eat first. And that is the priority of their living. But how receptive are they to the vaccine and how available and accessible are vaccines in Cameroon? Well, um, they are valuable, I tell you, but again, it depends on the people interest in having the vaccine. Because there's a lot of stories around this vaccine and all that. They have a special one that is administered in America or Europe, and then they have another uh, vaccine that they administer in Africa, and they write it clearly there that this vaccine should not be used in Europe and America. And so majority of the people are skeptical why there is a, a double standard in a vaccine that is supposed to com, com, uh, what call it, to combat a single disease. So tradition and the belief of the people pays a lot of, um, gives the, the people a lot of what I call leverage because they believe that if they're going to die, they'll die. But first they must walk. So, so this is the truth of the whole. So that obviously there's, there's still a whole, uh, there's need for a lot of education on COVID-19 and all that. But as a player in the extractive <laughs> industry, how much of a threat yes. is, you know, the, the Delta variant, how much of a threat is it to your business as a player in the extractive industry in Cameroon? Well, I obey the rules. I, I follow the protocols and all the things they say we should do and all that. But I can't speak for other people because other people have their opinions and they have their mind made up. There are some that are religious about it. There are some that are fanatically religious about it. And there are others too that want to work with you. But I know that those guys that are working with me, uh, some of them reserve their, their faith to God, whatever they conceive him to be in their heart. And they just want to walk and be able to put food on the table of their family. This is where they are interested in. So well, what's the government doing in regulating and enforcing, you know, the restrictions and, you know, the non-medical measures of dealing with COVID-19? You tell me something. You're talking about government enforcing. If government enforce, is it going to put food on the table of the people or just to lock the people up and tell them, oh, there is coronavirus and then there is no palliative for that? So if the government is coming up with, say, okay, stay in the house, at least I'll give you food, I'll give you what, then the people can stay at home. You know something, the stomach don't give a damn about coronavirus. And when it comes to the stomach, the stomach don't respect nobody, no policy, no government, nothing. People must eat. So it's not about government enforcing nothing. If government is going to enforce whatever it's going to enforce, then it must give people options. It must give people a palavity. It must give people reasons to obey the rules of coronavirus. Mm. So from your perspective now, the government has more to do in providing palliative for people to, you know, stick to the rules of uh, curbing the spread of COVID-19. Well, thank you so much, oh. uh, Mr. Albert Zekolu, for sharing your thoughts with us today on uh... bonjour, bonjour, name of, bonjour, name of, bonjour. <laughs> bonjour. All right, that was uh, Mr. Albert Okolu uh, sharing his thoughts with us on the, how COVID-19 is also affecting the forecast of the economy, the growth forecast of the economy. We move over to London now. The Commission of Insurance in Ghana, beg your pardon, not London, but Ghana. The Commission of Insurance in Ghana, Dr. Joseph Sofuri, says that about 25% of all insurance claims made in the country are fraudulent. According to the 2019 annual report of the National Insurance Commission, average daily claims incurred by non-live insurers in Ghana was up to 1.4 million Ghana CDs. Insurance fraud may fall into different categories from individuals committing fraud against consumers to individuals committing fraud against insurance companies. Non-medical insurance fraud is estimated at over $40 billion annually globally. 
fraudulent insurance claims stand at about 40 percent, while the figure sits around 25 percent in Ghana. The commissioner noted that insurance fraud does not only inflict extra costs on insurance companies, but it financially impacts ordinary consumers as they are forced to pay higher premiums at the end of the day. According to him, insurance companies in Ghana need to do better due diligence to ensure only legitimate claims are paid. And over 100 traders at the bond carrier co-market in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania are appealing to authorities to arrange low interest rate loans as capital so that they can start after their stalls and goods went up in flames a week ago. About 124 traders whose goods were burnt have been given temporary sanctuary at Kitsutu Market, but they say they do not know their fate yet. Out of 1,636 karaoke who have been reloca relocated traders affected by the fire, about 570 were relocated along Swahili Street and others at Kitsutu Market. Well, that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Amy John Mekwa.